أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك وبناتك ونساء المؤمنين يدنين عليهن يدنين عليهن من جلابي بهن ذلك أدنى أن يعرفن فلا يؤذين وكان الله غفورا رحيما لئن لم ينته المنافقون والذين في قلوبهم مرض والمرجفون في المدينة لنغرينك بهم ثم لا يجاورونك فيها إلا قليلا ملعونين أينما ثقفوا أخذوا وقتلوا تقتيلا سنة الله في الذين خلوا من قبل ولن تجد لسنة الله تبديلا يسألك الناس عن الساعة قل إنما علمها عند الله وما يدريك لعل الساعة تكون قريبا إن إن الله لعن الكافرين وأعد لهم سعيرا خالدين فيها أبدا لا يجدون وليا ولا نصيرا يوم تقلب وجوههم في النار يقولون يقولون يا ليتنا أطعنا الله وأطعنا الرسول وقالوا ربنا إنا أطعنا سادتنا وكبراءنا فأضلونا السبيلا ربنا آتهم ضعفين من العذاب والعنهم لعنا كبيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تكونوا كالذين آذوا موسى فبرأه الله من قالوا وكان عند الله وجيها يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما إنا عرضنا الأمانة على السماوات والأرض والجبال فأبين أن يحملنها وأشفقن منها وحملها الإنسان إنه كان ظلوما جهولا ليعذب الله المنافقين والمنافقات ليعذب الله المنافقين والمنافقات والمشركين والمشركات ويتوب الله على المؤمنين والمؤمنات 
وكان الله غفورا رحيما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all conditions and we seek Allah's protection from the condition of those who shall be entering hellfire. For indeed the heat in hellfire is far worse than any heat we can taste in the dunya. As the Quran says, قُلْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمَ أَشَدُّ حَرًّا You should know that the heat of the fire of Jahannam is far worse. So we ask Allah to protect us from that. We praise Him upon every condition. And we send blessings and salutations upon the masterpiece Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask Allah to bless all his household, his companions, to bless every single one of us who are seated here, all those who are listening, as well as those who shall listen, and even those from the ummah who have not listened and may not listen to this talk this evening, we still ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them. They are part of our family and they are also part of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, once again it brings a smile to the face to witness the brothers and sisters here in this beautiful city of Colombo. And we thank Allah for giving us the genuine feeling that we have within our hearts for one another and at the same time we ask Allah to accept from us our attendance and the fact that we are trying to learn a little bit more of the deen if we take a look at the duties we have we will find the pillars of Islam are five we start off with the shahada the utterance ashhadu alla ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu we bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides the one who made us, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we bear witness that there is the final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the messenger, the prophet, the one whom we follow, and we bear witness in that regard. Then we have the pillars of salah, which is the prayer. Then we have the pillar of zakah, which is the charities. And we have the pillars or the pillar of fasting as well as the pillar of Hajj. If you take a look at all these pillars of Islam, when we fulfill them correctly, they will develop our personality. One might ask how? If I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah, I will automatically follow His message and His message is full of personality development. He has told us the do's and the don'ts. And everything we say regarding social conduct is definitely part and parcel of what he has taught. And it came to us through Muhammadun Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one who taught this to us is Muhammad, may peace be upon him. So when we utter the words, he is the messenger, it means we are following him. Like Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell them that if they claim to love me, meaning if they claim to love Allah, then they should follow you, the messenger. So the sign that I love my maker is that I follow his messenger. That is the sign that I love my maker. And it would be the sign that you love your maker, that you follow the messenger. And if you follow the messenger, he is the one who brought the message to you. Today you have a band of people who will say, you know, I only adopt what is in the Quran. And whatever the Prophet brought, that's not important. The reality is, well, he brought the Quran. That's a reality. He is the one who brought the Quran. So it is through him that we got it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not come to me or to you to say, take this Quran, here it is. It came to us through the messenger. So we got it from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we believed and we still believe that he has brought it with amana and he has brought it fully with a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam. And it is handed to us. So where does personality development come from when it comes to the messenger? May Allah's peace be upon him. 
Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was asked about his character, his conduct, his personality. She answered using one word. And this hadith is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. His character and conduct or his personality was the Qur'an. So that one word summarized the whole character of this masterpiece, Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may peace be upon him. So if we take a closer look at his life, we will find through the books of history, the books known as the books of Seerah, that have recorded every aspect of his life, the way he spoke, the way he treated the Muslims, the way he treated the non-Muslims, the way he treated his family members, the way he resolved matters even prior to him being given the prophethood, the way he addressed community issues and matters, how he was looked at as the most trustworthy person. Amazing! All this points towards the masterpiece. When people did not like him and they swore him, he never swore them back in return. He knew he was not only a Muslim, but he was the messenger. And this is why we all know the story of the lady who had sworn Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are many such stories that are in his seerah and in his history. And he was helping her carry her goods from point A to point B. And as he was walking with these goods, she began swearing him, not knowing it is him in front of her. And he is the one helping her. And he was saying, there is a man in Mecca. You dare listen to him. Very bad man. He is swearing our forefathers. He doesn't agree with our gods. He is doing this. He is doing that. And so, so much she spoke. At that moment, he was silent. He did not say a word. What would we have done? Imagine you give someone a lift, and I've said this in the past, you give someone a lift, they jump into your beautiful vehicle, and they are swearing the owner of this supermarket, and they don't know it's you. They say, that man is greedy, he's stingy, he's jealous, and he is full of himself, and he never helps anyone, and he is like this, and he has divided, and he has what? Minimum, you would stop your car and say, out, out, move. That is minimum. I don't want to say maximum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us blessings. So what happened to our personality? We claim to be the followers of a man who did not do that. We claim to be the followers of a man who did not even think of doing that. What did he do? This woman was swearing him. And when he got to where he was getting to, he says, is there anything else that I can do for you? And she says, no, but what is your name? There came a stage when she asked, what is your name? You see, people of this age, they don't normally help so readily. He was beyond the age of 40. He got Nubuwa and prophethood at the age of 40. And so imagine how old he was and he was helping and assisting a lady, an elderly lady who was not related to him. He didn't even know her. She didn't even know him. For us today, I think a lot of the young would agree that we would only help someone if they really looked good enough to help. Allah protect us. Yes, it happens. Sometimes even the others slightly older fall into the same trap. So someone looks good enough to help, we'll help them based on what they look like, not based on anything else. May Allah make us from those who base our assistance on that which is humanitarian. Remember Muslim, non-Muslim. Some people think these are non-Muslims, we should not help them, leave them. You know, let them carry on. That is directly against this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Who did he help? Not only a non-Muslim, but someone he did not know. What made him help her? Humanitarian grounds. This was an elderly woman. And she needed assistance. She would have probably shuffled on her own, collecting her goods and someone else might have come to her assistance. Why wait for someone else to get the reward when you can get it? And you're standing right there. It's an opportunity, golden opportunity. Seize it. So he seized it. And then when he told her his name, he says, you see, there are different narrations that make mention of this. I'm going to say one of them. He says, you see, when I picked up your goods and I began to carry them for you, you started talking of a man and you mentioned this and you mentioned that and you said he is like this and he has sworn our gods and the gods of our forefathers and he has come to split and divide us and don't mix with him and don't listen to him and don't even look in his direction because he is a magician. Whoever looks in his direction, he casts a spell on them and they start accepting his message. 
and she's listening. He says, well, I want to tell you, I am Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Immediately, and we've heard this in the past, I'm sure. Immediately she said, well, if that's the case, I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah, the one you are calling to. And I bear witness that you are indeed a messenger. You are a prophet of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazing. Based on what? Based solely on his personality, nothing else. Anything else? Not a word. He did not yet give her da'wah. He didn't tell her Allah is one and this. She knew everything. A lot of the non-Muslims already know a lot. But they are waiting for us to behave in a manner that our messenger has taught us. And they will come through. Believe me. Bare minimum is the enmity they have against us will be minimized. You have in any country on the globe, there are a lot of non-Muslims. A lot of non-Muslims. And we have a policy. You have your faith, you are free to follow it. And we have our faith, we should be also free to follow it. This is it. We don't trample on your feet, you don't trample on ours. But we should be racing and competing with one another on humanitarian grounds to prove that we are actually following the more correct religion. And we are following that which is more beautiful and that which is even better. And we have higher teachings. If you look at the countries of the globe, when the Muslim traders came to the countries one by one, they accepted Islam based on what? Based on their character and conduct, based on their personality, the upright trading that they had. It was not based more on the fact that they went and shoved it down the people's throats. They did not do that. There were no swords used in Indonesia. In fact, Islam did not spread with the sword. It did not at all, unlike what people believe. Some people say Islam was spread by the sword. For your information, the largest number of human beings ever to enter the fold of Islam in a 10 year period was between the year 2000 and 2010. I'm talking of now. The largest in number, which sword was used? If any, they were used against us rather than anything else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an upright understanding. So I am only speaking of the first pillar of Islam. Still, we have uttered, I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides my maker, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad, may peace be upon him, is his messenger. That bearing of witness automatically will make us follow this example. Where are we and where is the example? It is about time we looked at it. Aisha radiallahu anha says, his personality was the Quran. Look at the Quran. I read verses before you where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Oh, you who believe, be conscious of your maker at all times and only utter that which is upright. Qulu qawlan sadidan. Utter that which is upright. Don't utter that which is not upright. What is upright? You tell the truth at all times. You don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't deceive. You don't use your tongue to abuse. In your own home, you utter words that are upright, that will result in the harmony of your home, the smiling of your wife. How many of us have uttered words that will make our wives laugh or smile or be happy? These are words, they are needed. Sometimes you might say, well, you know, you should feel it, it's in my heart. Come on, stop doubting me. Never mind doubting me. You need to say it. They need a reassurance. And my dear sisters, remember, the same rule applies to you. Sometimes some of the sisters don't say how much they love their husbands. They don't. And we normally attack the husbands. But we'd like to remind the sisters as well. It is not enough for that to be only in your heart. Yes, you show it with your actions. Indeed, you show it with your actions. That is more important. But they also need to hear it with their ears because Allah gave them ears. If we didn't have ears, we would say, don't worry. Don't say it, just show it. But because we have ears, they need to be, mashallah, what can I say? Let me use a good word. They need to be made up. You know the makeup you have? You need to make up your ears with good words. They, you know, you need to see ear stick, not the lipstick, but the ear stick. From what? From kind words uttered by those who are closest to you, your loved ones, your wife. Your children, have you uttered it to your children? How many of us have told our children, my son, I love you. My son, my daughter, you are the most important person in my life. 
I think many of us have grown up thinking that that is taboo. Yet the Prophet ﷺ made sure that he kissed his children and his grandchildren and he kissed little children as well. And he made it known that he loves them to bits and pieces. And he was so much engrossed in love with them, with his own children and grandchildren, that one day in Salah, one of his grandchildren was on his back and he could not get up from sujood. Firstly, what was the child doing in the masjid? Today we have a child of that age in the masjid. I think we will tear down the whole masjid. People will rip you to pieces. What is that little baby doing here? And secondly, on top of the Imam. And thirdly, delaying getting up from sajda. What did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? He continued, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. He continued in his sajda. And when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum tried to have a look at what was going on, because it was something very important, there was a delay here. They noticed, oh, this is the grandchild playing on his back whilst he's in sajda. He delayed the sajda, no big deal. Today the child would get two smacks, mashallah. Who do you think you are? Next time watch out. Never mind that, that Imam himself would probably be fired. So the two smacks were worth it. What were you doing with your grandchild here? So where is this personality and where are we? We can be religious, but we have not yet made our own children feel loved. We have not yet told them, do you know that I really adore you? Do you know that I work in order to earn money in order to spend on you? Do you know that I love you? This is why I take you here and I do this for you and I do that. Why don't we remind them? Why don't we tell them? And remember, when you have told them, it is not enough to only tell them. Hand in hand, we need to show it. Mashallah. No use to come in home, say, Oh my wife, I love you. And next thing you're busy on your blackberry with another woman somewhere else. Well, what was that? Just to pacify her? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May He safeguard us. Same applies to the women folk. No use to pretend that you love someone when you actually don't. And it's important for us to say this, to work towards it. It is personality. The reason I say this, it is within the home. Do you know? Today I want to inform you of something very important. One day, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, who was the best friend of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and at the same time he was the father-in-law of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he passed by the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he heard his daughter having a big argument. Now you know, husband and wife sometimes, they can raise a little bit of their voices once in a while, I think, I hope it doesn't happen often. But sometimes, maybe with respect and so on, you might want to put a point forward and so on. We should remember to control your temper, your anger, your emotions when they are about to explode is an act of worship. Remain silent. Let them know sometimes, you know, I'm not in a very good mood, so please excuse me if I don't talk much, just excuse me for a while. It's better than to start screaming and yelling and telling them things that will make matters worse. So if you take a look at what happened to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he was passing and he heard this. He asked to be allowed to enter and he was given permission. He admonished his daughter and he shook her up basically. What are you doing? Arguing with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa What is this? And anyway, after a while he went away. And on his return, he heard them laughing. Allahu Akbar. He heard them laughing. His daughter with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they were now having a good moment. And he made a very, very famous statement. He says, allow me to take part in your happiness in the same way that you allowed me to take part in your war a few moments ago. A few moments ago, I took part in your war. Now allow me to take part in your moment of happiness. What does this teach us? It teaches us that the father-in-law of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did not interfere in the life of his daughter at all. Unless it was in a positive way. Today your daughter has a problem. No, fix him. Sort him out. You, what's your problem? Why are you doing? Go and follow that example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. Look at their personality. When the daughter had a problem or not, or, not, or not even a problem, when she spoke slightly loudly, he did not want to know what went wrong. He said, you watch out. To who? To his own daughter. Allahu Akbar. The tables have turned. 
And in no way am I condoning those who are oppressing their wives. But I am telling the fathers of those who have girls and daughters and even those who have sons that be careful when you involve in the marriage of your children, only involve in a positive way, not in a negative way, unless you really have to, unless they have come to you as a last resort for assistance because they are being oppressed, then everything changes. So I hope we've understood. I've tried to balance that statement. But go back to that personality. To start with, you say, no, make your home. You are wrong. How can you speak in this manner? No matter what, look at your error. Go and try again. Go and see this. Go and see. And then you have the personality of a Muslim coming up. And this is when marriages will work. But today we side with our own child. Based on what? Based on the fact that they are our child. Not on what is right and wrong. This is what is happening on the globe. And many people today, they have taught their children, look, anything, just phone me, I will fix him. You might have heard that. What type of statement is this? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Then we have so many other examples in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is where the term Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes into play. Let me move a little bit further. I will come back to this. But let me take you to the next pillar of Islam, the pillar of Salah. How is it that it will develop my personality? The Quran says, Read that which has been revealed to you in the book, which is the Quran. And establish your salah, your five daily prayers. For indeed salah prohibits from evil and immorality. And indeed Allah is the greatest and He knows exactly what you are doing. Amazing. Allah is telling you salah prohibits from immorality and evil. Let me inform you how. If you are in the condition of wudu, and you know that you are remaining in the condition of wudu, then automatically there are certain things you will not engage in. Because you know they will compromise your wudu to start with. So we are taught to remain in the condition of ablution as far as possible. Number one, it calms you down, it cools you, it protects you from the devil, and it keeps you away from certain sin. That is only starting with wudu. Number two, we know that the, the prayers are spread out through the day. So I've read my morning prayer. What am I doing? If I am a real Muslim, I would know that I am busy with my maker. I have raised my hands, I have tied them for my maker. In my prayer, I will look on to a certain spot. I'm not going to look around. You know, you don't find people praying and they're admiring the chandeliers in the mosque and they're looking this way. And then suddenly they look up a little bit. They look down, they see the carpet, you know, and they look the other way. They see another man there. And they might say, you know, sorry, I might not meet you later. Let me greet you now. That does not happen in the masjid. Why? Because we are taught to look in one place. One of the reasons is, if five times a day, you can, for the sake of your maker, put your eyes on one spot, then for the rest of the day, it should be easy for you, for the sake of your maker, to put your eyes lower, where you are not meant to be looking. Amazing. But when your salah is not in order, then everything else, you're looking everywhere. That man who cannot lower his gaze, and that woman who does not lower her gaze, in salah, she has one of two things, or he has one of two things. They either don't look where they are meant to be looking, or they don't have concentration. One of two things. May Allah protect us. So sometimes people ask you, I need concentration in my prayer. My beloved brother or sister, start by lowering your gaze elsewhere. Then when you lower your gaze in salah, it will come with concentration. Otherwise, when you lower your gaze in salah, and it has not been lowered outside, may Allah protect us, the devil can come and make us think of the dirtiest things whilst we are in salah. Why? Because we didn't bother lowering our gaze. We were worried about everything else. So much so, 
that to occupy your mind with that which is unnecessary can also snatch away the concentration in salah. You have occupied it with the latest car and the latest phone and this and that iPhone app and this Blackberry app and this thing and that thing and this person and that person and oh what have you, this deal and that deal. As soon as you enter salah, you know, Allahu Akbar and all you are paying is just lip service to it. And the Imam is reading and you're happily just thinking, oh yes, you know, Soon as I finish, I saw that deal, you know, it's Christmas time and that shop had a deal. I need to, you know, uh, quickly get that as soon as possible before it is out of stock. And the Imam says, Allahu Akbar to go in Rukur and you are still thinking, oh yes, I will go. Oh, oh okay. You know, suddenly you are alerted to say the Imam is gone down. Your deal is not complete in your head, but the Imam is gone down. So what are we doing? Our personality is not being developed because we have not understood the essence of our prayer. Some of us could not even be bothered to pray five times a day. How dare? And then we want to say, I need to develop. I, let me tell you, Islam is a religion. Allah says, if you don't want to follow it, we don't need you. We will bring others who will follow it. And wallahi, it is growing so rapidly. Never in the history of the globe has the globe witnessed so many people entering the fold of Islam. What are they seeing in it? They are seeing what we always know, but we don't want to follow. So you find all these weird sects that are coming about that are telling you, you know, it is permissible to listen to music and it is permissible and it is not important to look at the hadith and so on. All this are people who were sometimes born Muslims because those who have come into Islam, they are far stricter, far stricter. But you have people born Muslims who start debating. Allah says, May Allah protect us. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْا يَسْتَبْدِ الْقَوْمَ غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ If you are going to turn away, we will replace you with others who will not be like you. They will be different. They will worship us. They will come forth. They will engage in what we have told them to engage in in a proper way. And they will abstain from what we have informed them to abstain from in a proper way. So my beloved brothers and sisters, the deen is something we need to hold fast upon. If we don't, it's going to slip out of our hands and someone else will hold on to it. We need to know that. Let us make an effort. We are so fortunate. Wallahi, if you study religions and you have studied Islam in depth, you will know that you have a blessing. You will know that you are so blessed. And this is why we say, never underestimate the Almighty and His power. Never ever think that you are a write-off, written off. Never think that. Why? Because... A little flicker in your heart can change you forever and ever. But the problem is when you have one reminder, so it's like trying the engine and then you haven't really kicked it up to when it starts. After a while, you get another reminder. So you try your engine again, but you haven't allowed it to crank until it actually starts. And then you have a third one. By the time four or five happen, the carburetor becomes flooded and you will not start it. It's over. What does that mean? It means Allah will send you one reminder, you'll feel in your heart, I want to turn. Allah sends you another reminder, you feel in your heart, I want to turn. Allah sends you another reminder, you feel in your heart, I want to turn. That feeling in your heart is not going to continue forever and ever. After a while, your carburetor will be flooded and you will not get that feeling anymore. And it's not going to come to you. So when you have a feeling, let me turn to Allah, turn now. Don't wait for tomorrow morning. Remember, it is La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the statement that will take us into paradise. We know it, we've understood it. We should try and learn more about it, put it into practice, consider ourselves those who are fortunate. And this is why we tell the sisters who do not want to dress properly, they don't want it. They say, no ways, I'm not bothered. Sometimes you now get people who are telling you, why do I need to cover my hair? Where in Islam does it say, cover your hair? A'udhu billah. And they say, show me the evidence. What do you mean, show me the evidence? It's full, it's there. And you may debate and argue till you turn green. But remember, people might not want to argue with you. They will leave you at times. Because of the way you've asked the question. And what I want to say is if a person does not want to dress appropriately, Allah creates another 10 somewhere in the villages of Africa who dress more appropriately. Somewhere in the corner of Sri Lanka, people who cannot even afford proper clothing, but they will dress properly. 
There is a hadith that I read yesterday, connected to yesterday's topic on calamities, where there was a woman who was described as an African woman who was a Sahabiyya, a woman who met the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "O oh Messenger, peace be upon him. I have a sickness where I suffer seizures. You know, she faints. She suffers seizures, and I'd like you to pray for me." Because when I suffer the seizure and I don't know what's happening, part of my body shows. Part of my body shows and I don't even know. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if you want, you bear patience and in return, Allah gives you Jannah. And if you want, I can pray for you and you will be cured. Now this is a choice that is not easy. If someone tells you, I can pray for you, you will be cured. Or you bear patience on this condition and in return, Allah will give you paradise. Nothing else. Paradise. What do you think this young lady decided to choose? I think me and you, let's be honest. We would say, you know what? Pray for me. I need to be cured. I need the seizure to stop. I need this difficulty I'm in to stop. I need this calamity to stop. She was very intelligent. She says, O oh Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I choose paradise. Allahu Akbar. I choose paradise. But ask Allah that when I am suffering this condition, part of my body is exposed. That must not happen. So she is worried that in the condition of sickness she was being exposed, she needed to cover herself. Today in the most glorious part of our health, in the most peak of our age, we have no sickness, no seizures. We open our bodies in with the intention of turning people's heads. And we say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to add salt onto the wound. Allah protect us. Look at the example. Then we don't want calamity to come in our direction. Then we don't want anything to happen. How we have lost that Islamic personality. Look at this lady. What type of a Muslim was she? She was so powerful that she decided these seizures. Look what she decided. Let's analyze it. She thought to herself, the seizures are going to last for a few more years until I die. Ultimately, we're all going to die. Even if I don't have seizures from today, I will still die when my time is written. And if I have the seizures, I will have how many seizures? Perhaps a hundred or two hundred or three hundred before I die. If, if someone says you have three hundred seizures and in return you get paradise, I think it's a free deal to be honest with you. It's free. Allahu Akbar. So this was her thinking. Look at this. Today we are not ready, number one, to bear patience over the smallest calamity. And number two, we are not worried about how we dress yet. We are not suffering. May Allah make us from those who are concerned. And I know whilst I am saying this, we respect all Muslims, no matter how they dress. The fact that they are Muslim, we respect them. They may have a deed better than mine and yours. They may arrive in paradise before me and you because Allah loved them for something. All I have done today is encourage those who have not dressed properly yet to say, look, there is room for you to improve and there is room for us all to improve. You know, personality, character and conduct is such, nobody can say they have arrived at the peak. There is room for myself as well. And every one of us, no matter how high you are in personality, there is room for improvement. If you believe there isn't, you are not on a high level of personality. And this is why we don't look down upon others. We don't. We consider them equals or we consider them better than us or we, we give them that opportunity to say perhaps they have a deed. Perhaps they are crying at night to their maker. Perhaps the sincerity of the few deeds that they are doing far better than the sincerity of the many deeds we may be doing. This is how we look at it. That is also personality. Because a person with a rotten personality is he who thinks I am the one, I am the most pious, I am the best, I am the most good looking, I have the best clothing, I have the best. And all these people are a waste of time. If that is our attitude, we will be not only hated by people in silence. When I say in silence, I mean people might not have the guts to tell us because of our wealth, because of our status, because of what we can do to them. You know, 
People might not have the guts, but people will hate us, number one. We cause disunity. And if more people had to be like us, there would be a war on earth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. This is why we say, learn from that great personality. I was speaking of prayer, salah. Imagine what it teaches us. Let me give you something else in terms of personality that the prayer will teach us. If you've attended the prayer which is read in jama'ah in a congregation, how many people speak at once? One. And who speaks? The leader. And after a while, he gives you a chance to say something, doesn't he? He says, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ And what do we say? Ameen. I'm sure you all know that and we all do do that. But can you say Ameen whilst he is saying, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ And you say, Ameen. صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Ameen. Can you say that? We are taught not to speak out of turn. Wait for your moment, then you utter what is required of you. We are being trained automatically. Personality development through salah. Look at this. If you have a meeting and 50 people want to talk together, it's better for you to walk out. Because nobody's going to make heads from tails. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. No one. You have one person speaking at a time. When you have to say something, you can raise your hand. When you are given the opportunity or the permission, you can say what you want on condition that you don't waste people's time. And on condition that you realize what you have to say, the best words in the shortest time, and you get across the message. We learn that from where? Personality development from Salah. And I've just given you one point. I can still give you another point. You see, in Salah, are we allowed to just walk wherever we want? Do you see people walking and reading Salah? He's suddenly Allahu Akbar and he's walking through the market. Do you see that happening? No. Why? You are supposed to stand in one place when you are reading Salah. And not move unnecessarily. Not move without necessity to move. So we are standing in one spot. Why? Is there something haram next to you? Is there something wrong in the masjid? Is there something unclean? No. It is just Allah's decision to say, don't move. You are standing in front of your maker. If I can, for the pleasure of my maker, put my feet at a spot which will please him five times a day without moving, then I need to know that outside the five times of the day, I should only put my feet in a place which will please him. What's the point of walking towards the nightclub when I was reading Salah 10 minutes ago? I could keep my feet on a spot for him, but now I can't keep my feet from going into to a nightclub for the same creator. So if my Salah was in order, and if my standing was in order in Salah, then I won't go to a haram place, and I won't end up using my feet to walk towards that direction because I have trained myself and I've been trained five times a day to stand in a spot. My personality was developed automatically. This is why Allah says, "Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar." Salah prohibits a person from immorality and evil. Part of immorality is when we speak that which is immoral. Imagine if I am to read salah. I say, praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. He is the owner of the day of judgment. You know, most forgiving, most merciful. You alone we worship. You alone we seek for. We seek help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not the path of those who have earned your anger, nor those who have gone astray. And we say, Amin. And we are uttering pure words from our mouths. Ten minutes later, we are swearing. What does that mean? That salah taught us nothing. Nothing. We pay. We probably don't understand what we are saying. Nothing. When I say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدُ And you find later on, the man says, this man knows how to say it very nicely. His voice is beautiful. Forget about the voice. What is the message? What is the message? Allah is one, alone. Subhanallah, completely independent, no one like unto Allah, in none of his names or qualities and so on. And then a person who says that with a true heart, do you really think he can go home and start swearing his wife and children? Do you really think he can come onto the street and look at someone and say, you know what, this person is very, very bad and start swearing them huge swear words. Can they do that? If their salah was in order, they wouldn't do that. The same applies, the typical problem we have in nearly every masjid on the globe. Nearly every masjid on the globe, we have a certain problem. 
When we get to the time of Jumu'ah, Friday prayer, or the Eid prayer, or very important prayer, something important, we find some of the most pious who might be rushing to read their salah right in the front. They've parked their car blocking the neighbor, mashallah, blocking the neighbor. Well, if you want to do that, there is no problem. All you need is to give them a complimentary helicopter, inshallah. Then you can do that, inshallah. Especially when your car is a beautiful one. Just come in, drop a helicopter, say, look, this helicopter is for every time I come, I might block your driveway. If you want to get out, you can jump. Or give them a trampoline, mashallah. <laughs> Allah accept us and grant us goodness. The point I'm making is it's very bad for us to be inconsiderate. Wallahi, you'd rather miss one rakah. You'd rather miss part of your prayer than to block someone else. That is personality of a Muslim. You block a person. What type of image are we giving them? In these countries where we are in a minority and even in countries where we are in a majority, but more so in a country where others are looking at us, they are watching us. They think these are the most arrogant people based on the deeds of five people out of five million people. Five people have spoiled it for five million because their personality was smelling bad. It had a stench. Literally, it was stinking. Allahu Akbar. They didn't know how to park a simple vehicle. We haven't learned anything, if that is the case. We don't know how to prioritize. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who understand, those who can take heed, those who realize Islam is not just going to the masjid and praying five times a day. There is a deeper lesson to learn from that. That's why I chose today to look at the five pillars of Islam and to show how each one of them develops your personality in a different way. Let's take a look at the next one. Zakah. Zakah is when you are giving your charities to the poor. The Quran says, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِّرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ Allahu Akbar. Take from their wealth, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a portion as a charity that will result in their cleansing. It will cleanse them. It will clean them not only outwardly, but even internally. It will cleanse them. And pray for them. Allahu Akbar. So the charity is meant to cleanse us. In what way? It's our character and conduct. It's our personality. As well as the wealth we have will be cleansed.